Now, ahead of tomorrow's budget, the chance of Jeremy Hunt, we're told, is going to freeze fuel duty. That'll cost the Treasury about £5 billion, but we still don't know whether we're going to get those tax cuts or uh, national insurance cuts that we've been told about on what's going to happen to public spending. Well, someone who might have a better idea than most of us is my next guest, Kate Andrews, Economics Editor at The Spectator. Hello to you, Kate. Hi, Julia. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Now, we know the fuel duty. I mean, there have been campaigns on this led by Howard Cox at Fairview UK. I don't think anyone realistically thought that uh, any chance that we'd be brave enough to raise fuel duty ain't going to happen. However, we know the big debate going on at Downing Street between 10 and 11 right now is about whether or not there are going to be tax cuts, how much they're going to be and what sort of tax is being cut. What is the debate and what do you expect for us to hear after 12.30 tomorrow lunchtime? I think it's practically certain we're getting some kind of tax cut. The question is what it is. And the debate has been between taking more off of employee national insurance or focusing on an income tax cut. It is cheaper to cut employee national insurance. It costs about five billion pounds for every P you take off of NI, whereas it's seven billion pounds for every penny you want to take off the basic rate of income tax. I think it's quite clear that from an election perspective, the government would like to be targeting income tax because it affects more people and they think it's a better selling point going into the election. People will have a better understanding of what that income tax cut means. It's a question of whether or not they have the money. And it's incredibly telling about the state of the public finances that they are having to scrape together the money to come up with the kind of tax cut that Yes, I mean, look, we'll take it, right? It'll be great to have some kind of tax cut announcement, but it's still not quite what they were promising they would do even just a few months ago when they were talking about changing the narrative, really going for major tax cuts, slashing the state. I wouldn't expect to see anything like that. No, indeed. And when you talk about 1P or 2P, given how many people have been dragged in by this, this fiscal drag, mm -hmm. as it's known, um, to higher and higher tax thresholds, because, yeah, they've had a pay rise, but they had a pay rise, which often probably didn't even cover the inflation in prices mm -hmm. they've been seeing. So they're paid a lot more, they might think, but they're actually paying a higher rate of tax on that extra money. They're going to get a pay, you know, a tax cut of some sort, whether it's national insurance, 1P or 2P or income tax they're still realistically going to be worse off than they were a few years ago. This is such an important point, Julia, and it's what I'm going to be looking out for tomorrow. So if we go back to November, last November in the autumn statement, when the Tory party uh, cut, uh, did meaningfully cut tax, I think, on employee national insurance and propped up business investment, they came out afterwards and they said, you know, we are the Tory party, we cut tax, it's what we do. But if you looked at the overall tax burden, it did not move. It was exactly the same as the forecast from March 2023, which showed the tax burden reaching a post-war or high. I think the huge question for the Tories tomorrow is can they get that tax burden falling? Because to your point, they are giving with one hand but taking with another by freezing tax thresholds. That is a huge yeah. stealth tax. Millions more people are being pulled into paying tax and being pulled in to paying a higher rate of tax. And workers understand this you know they, yeah. they understand the kind of money we, they're we, taking this home is the thing better off or... <laughs> this is the thing we know we know at the end of the month whether we've got money left over after you're paying the rent or the mortgage or buying food or uh, or anything else we need to do people know don't they um the thing is, we're told, you know, the economy is, is not in such bad nick as, as a lot of people think. And yet, we, we latest figures show at the end of last year, we were in recession, but we may well have come out of that. There's a lot of talk that the Office of Budget Responsibility, who sort of set the parameters in which the government can operate, and how much fiscal headroom, a complete load of nonsense that we have, because, of course, with massive debt, there isn't really any fiscal headroom at all for any of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but the OBR, we understand that... Well, what? sources are claiming from the Treasury is pretty negative and things are not looking good for the public finances. Would big tax cuts make a difference? Would they be the boost to the economy? Because we're constantly told what we need is to get growth, what we need is to boost productivity. But it doesn't seem that anyone seems to ever be able to achieve that. We haven't seen a boost to growth or productivity in decades. So look, are tax cuts part of the growth equation? Yes. Are they everything? No. And that was the huge mistake that Liz Truss made in her 49 days of her premiership. She wanted to slash tax while also spending a heck of a lot of money. Her energy price guarantee at the time was estimated to cost up roughly £100 billion over the course of a year. It didn't cost that much, but that's what the estimates were at the time and what the markets were being asked to lend. And that combination turned out to be a disaster. I think what Jeremy Hunt has done 
done well, if we again go back to the autumn statement, as he has put tax cuts back on the agenda. But as we saw in that autumn statement, a lot of that was around business investments. So certain kinds of tax cuts are going to be better for growth than others. What we have been missing for years, dare I say for 14 years, is that meaningful supply side reform. Where are the changes to the um, where are the changes to the planning sector? Where are those million homes that we needed yesterday? Where are the efficiency gains in the public sector? Where are the efficiency gains in the National Health Service? The issue we have is that the economy has been stagnant. And yes, it has bounced back from COVID, but we have lost out on years of growth. And until the government's willing to deal with those underlying factors, tax cuts should really be at the, at the end. They should be uh, the prize that you get for the really hard work leading up to those tax cuts. You know, we've made those major fundamental changes changes to help get economic growth off the ground. Now we've got the money to cut no, tax. Indeed. And, and of course, the, so, the decisions are politically complicated. Indeed, so many people at the bottom end of the pile are struggling so hard. That's not what they're looking <laughs> for. Poll after poll also shows what people want is more money going into public services as they are crumbling. Yes, they want more efficiency, but again, we never seem to get that. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're going to have to uh, give in and pay more money, seems to be the answer. Um, there's, you've also, the spectator, identified this huge number of people who are of working age, often, in, you know, as young as in, you know, 1820s and the 30s, who are not working, claiming some sort of incapacity to work, sickness, long-term sickness. Um, we are unique in the Western world with these numbers. We've got a low unemployment rate because it's hidden unemployment, is it not? We need to get those people back to work. Yes, the unemployment rate is deeply misleading. It's at a near record low, but it doesn't include people who are not looking for work. And if we look at those who are on some kind of out of work benefit in the UK now of working age, that number is over 5.5 million. Perhaps one of the most distressing thing about that is how many young people make up that figure and that number is only growing. And there are a lot of reasons for this. I think COVID and furlough uh, changed the game on this, but there are also very serious issues around mental health and access to mental health health care, which the NHS and, and you know, job centres and the rest of it are simply not equipped Indeed. to handle it. And again, that's just a whole big, I mean, that's like a three-hour show on its own dealing with that. Kate, I Anytime. hope you'll come back and talk to us again. We'll see what happens uh, uh, when the uh, Chancellor stands up, be live here on Talk TV tomorrow. Uh, Kate uh, Andrews from The Spectator, economic editor, thank you. Quick word from Charlie Rowley on that, former special advisor. Again, you know, dealing with a lot of, you know, the fallout of these things. We've got, we spend a fortune, we have pay fortune in taxes, but our services don't work. What do you want to hear from the Chancellor tomorrow? Well, I certainly want to hear what some of the things that Kate was saying there, so um, are dealing with the supply side reform, so cutting yeah. regulation in particular yeah. areas. Build like some house houses. Building, build some homes, exactly. Um, uh, and in all of those other areas. So I hope we can see um, uh, uh, that tomorrow. But I think you're right, the same people that want to see more tax, and uh, more spending on public services are probably the same people when polled that wanted more lockdown rules. Because when it comes oh, to yeah. it, uh, you know, people say they want one thing, but actually when it comes yeah. to it, um, they're, they're doing something quite different. I, I remember saying at one point, if you want more lockdowns, you have to agree you're the ones who pay for it. The rest of us won't. We're going to get back to our normal lives. Charlie Rowley, thank you.